Get ready to be amazed. Get ready to be transformed. Get ready to believe it is possible. You're entering the growth zone on the Guts and Glory Show with your host, Louise Scott. Hey guys, welcome to the Guts and Glory Show, a show dedicated to helping you learn just a little more so that you can be bigger and better than you were before. And I'm your host, Luis. I'm excited that you're here joining us. As you know, on this show, we talk about uh, the guts it takes to succeed and the glory of success. So I always have guests who are already successful, who can tell you the pitfalls of building a business and also who can guide us in making right decisions. So today our guest is Jason Kruger. And I love uh, talking to people who are in San Diego because it is my favorite city uh, in the United States. I can't say the world. I haven't been everywhere in the world, but it is one of my favorite cities. Uh, it is the weather is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, if I if I wasn't tied to where I am today, I would probably move there because I absolutely love the city. Jason, welcome to the show. Yep, thanks, Luis. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So I want to start off because pre-show we were talking about you starting your business, and um, I was very intrigued by the fact that you have a relative almost a hundred employees in your business, and that's very uncommon for a. Uh, an accounting CFO analytics type of, of business. And so I asked you when you started your business, you said 2008. And I was like, whoa, like that's the almost the sounds like yeah. the worst time to start a business. <laughs> so I'm curious, like what made you start your business in 2008? What did you learn in that process? I mean, that was that was a tough time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I always start off by saying, well, it's probably a little bit of ignorance, you know, when I jumped right in. Um, but before I started uh, the company in 2008, my, I'll give a brief background. My my background is in public accounting. Uh, I I have my CPA. Uh, my my background uh, in public accounting was within financial statement audit. Um, so I spent uh, a number of years with some of the bigger firms uh, in the country. A couple of years with Moss Adams, and then uh, about seven or eight years with Deloitte, which is one of the big public big four public accounting firms. And so what I saw working with those. Uh, within those firms, as we we worked with all different types of companies, um, we small, big, uh, Fortune 500, and what I saw in the small mid market is really companies that deserved better than what they had within accounting and finance. Meaning, they had maybe a bookkeeper. Uh, they started to outgrow the sophistication of that bookkeeper. They started to not get uh, have confidence in in the numbers that they were getting, and um, and all they were really getting out of accounting was they were, you know, invoicing and paying their bills and, um, you know, made sure they had enough cash for payroll. And what we wanted to do was uh, shift that mindset to, as companies grow, to be able to scale and grow uh, effectively and to achieve the goals that these business owners have, there has to be some level of financial understanding and visibility that allows them to make decisions to achieve the goals that they have. And so we started, I, or I started Signature Analytics in 2008. I had uh, uh, I had a very understanding wife at the time who was able to cover some of our our main bills, of course, and uh, we didn't have any kids, and so I was able to jump in with two feet and and really go after it and uh, and see if I could make it happen. And so it was really just myself. Um, I did that in October of '08, which, as you know, is or if you can recall, is you know the economy was falling apart, and but at, at the same time I didn't have employees, so I didn't have the stress of of trying to make payroll and those types of things. Um, but, um, you know, I figured, hey, you know, now's the time for me personally. Um, I have the background and the experience um, that I acquired over the 10 years prior to that. And there's a lot of value I can still give to companies out there. And um, so I started, you know, myself, bought a computer and uh, started going out there and, and, and building relationships and within the community of San Diego at the time, and um, and starting to to drive new opportunities, but you know it was everything from flying by the seat of my pants at the beginning to doing everything and and trying to find you know people to support the work and to to establishing over a period of time and years, um, you know building out a full time employee model, uh, building our internal processes, which is critical to our success, uh, building mm -hmm. our back office, even you know our HR functionality, sales, marketing. Um, improving the the how we service our clients to ensure the quality of the work is there. So all of that over a period of time 
has grown. And, you know, ultimately, uh, after 16 years, you end up with almost 100 employees. Uh, <laughs> but I would, the last thing I'll say is I love the the name of your of your show because, you know, guts and glory. I mean, the reality is sometimes sometimes you get asked, well, how did you get from where you were to, to where you are? Or, you know, how did you how were you able to grow a company? And I said, well, a lot of it is pure willpower. Right. It's like, hey, it's I'm going to jump in and I'm going to make it happen. And sometimes it's going to and it's most likely going to take longer than you expect it to, do, to happen. But if you have that belief and that willpower to make it happen and you jump in with two feet, um, that'll get you a long way. Uh, and a lot further than a lot of individuals that maybe jump in with one foot um, or after six months to say, hey, you know, it's not working. I'm going to stop doing it. And so that willpower and that guts, you know, is what really, you know, helps, I think, or at least help me to succeed in what I was doing. Let me just make a note that after 16 years, it is not the natural progression to have 100 employees. So I know, I know you were joking. <laughs> uh, it, takes, it takes a lot more than just being in business 16 years. Uh, so I applaud you for that. How did you stay committed in that process? And and because um, one of the things that I deal with when I'm working with clients is this feeling of overwhelm, stress. I can't keep doing this. I hear these things like, oh my gosh, like I don't know how I can continue on. During the tough times, what was it that you were focusing on that helped you stay committed? Yeah. I think for me, it was always focusing on the core of our work and and the future and, and what we were looking to accomplish. And so what I mean by that is always looking at, you know, if the goal is to get to, you know, pick a number, 10 million, 20 million, 100 million, um, what, what needs to happen to get there? And, you know, it's all about scalability, right? So building that foundation from the beginning and that mindset of, our model is recurring revenue model. We work with companies and clients uh, on a recurring basis. So meaning we support and drive the success of their, their internal accounting department um, and support them at the CFO level as necessary as well. So for us, it's recurring revenue. So how do we continue to build that base of recurring revenue and also support our clients and, and maintain those clients by providing them that quality of, of service and work? So it was always about achieving, you know, looking forward and saying, okay, how do we maximize if I'm going to sell at some point in the future, how do I always look at maximizing the business value? So I'm building this the right way and the smart way. Um, not all about me. It's not all about Jason. If I leave, I don't want the value of the firm or the company to diminish. So how do I build that around me? Um, and then how do I continue to uh, build, you know, one client at a time to to achieve the goals I have. And so, you know, a lot of that again is um, you can't get from zero, to, well, most, you know, firms can't get from zero to 10 million in professional service overnight. And so again, it's the steps along the way. Um, it's celebrating the successes along the way that you're having, the excitements, um, and really always looking at, for me, it was looking at the long-term vision. And I've always had, I think I've always had some level of patience being able to wait it out knowing that hey, at least we're moving forward in the right direction. Yeah, I think patience is a big thing. Uh, there's so many people who want that quick success. They, they want to see something happen immediately because they want to increase their lifestyle. And I've always talked about how many times business owners, they live at a lifestyle that they haven't earned yet. And what I, what I mean by that is they make their first 200,000, 300,000 in personal income and they go out and are, are doing $60,000 vacations. And they're, right. I'm like, invest in your business. Like, don't go out and do that. Get, get to a point where that three, four, five hundred thousand dollar income level is more predictable and sustainable. So that way you don't have shortfalls. And I think patience yeah. is a really big thing that I see with young entre entrepreneurs is social uh, media glorifies uh, entrepreneurship in a way that it, that doesn't really exist out there. Like yeah. there's a there's a true grind when it comes to to entrepreneurship. Now, yeah, as you've hired people, especially after the the, the pandemic recently in 2020. What have what challenges have you seen in finding great people? Because that's another sticking point in growing a business is is how do we find and retain great talent? What are some strategies that you've used? Yeah, yeah. Well, I say I will say it took four years before I hired my first employee. So talking about that patience and that grind we were talking about, and 
and really trying to figure it out. That was the first four years was really trying to figure that process out. Um, and then, you know, was able to hire my first employee and build off of that. And the good thing is the, the, the individual that we hired, she's still with us. Um, I guess it's 12 years later, Amazing, um, which yeah. is fantastic. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a slow progression. Um, I can't emphasize the value of um, culture and what actually a, 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 an awesome director of HR can bring to a company. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's like, I, I didn't even know what, hardly know what HR was, right? And a lot of companies don't know what HR is or what it, what it, what it means. But HR really creates that culture, um, that foundation for to develop a, a culture and an organization that people want to work for and want to work with, right? And, and that culture is so critical in not only attracting the talent, but in uh, keeping the talent as well. And that's something that we're constantly working on and working to improve is that culture. And not only it culture isn't just about fun things and doing fun things like going to a baseball game or going to a happy hour. It's really about how do you ensure when you're hiring people, how, you know, how do you give them the, the foundation or the platform to be able to achieve the goals that they have in their career and in their life? And so that's something that we work heavily on is showing our team the, the progression of their career, their career development, what it means if you come in at this level, what it means and how you get to this level, and what it also means if you decide to leave. Hope we want you everybody to stay, but we also celebrate if somebody has been here for five years and they decide to leave and they, ha they, they have a great opportunity, that's a success and we celebrate that as well. Um, so we want to develop a platform that allows people to succeed and grow. Um, and the other is, you know, obviously HR helped to develop that process. We also have a full-time recruiter who's always looking for uh, talent. And we've really developed our, our process on how we interview and how we find talent. Um, is, is We've really dialed that in over the years on how we do that. Um, and then the, the last thing I can say is uh, for what we do, you know, the interview is important, but we also do... Uh, live role plays and um, you know and and a test that's involved too from a from a, um, a skill set perspective to make sure that we have confidence that this individual not only can do the work from a technical perspective, which is important, but what we was important for us too is being able to communicate effectively with our clients uh, to drive success in their environment. What are some things that you do? Um, Cause I'm always curious when, when companies say they have great cultures, um, I, I'm, uh, I'm always curious, what do they do that's uniquely different? Is there anything that you do that is unique and that sets you apart from a culture standpoint that may be creating that pool to bring mm -hmm. people in and keep them there? Yeah, I think one of the things that we did, and you know, I even grew up in the, you know, the big four and, to the support you got is really is you you got evaluated from the people who what job you were on and they evaluated you and you got instruction and support from them and then you may go to another job and work with somebody else or report to somebody else and then they give you some sort of like a buddy or something like that right well we've what we've done is we've gone a lot deeper than that and we've created an entire people management structure behind the scenes so that everybody has a people manager that they report to that supports them. It's more than just a buddy because the people manager um, has the tough conversations with them as well. The people manager is involved in the hiring process. So when we need a, a new individual at a new level, uh, that people manager is identified and they're part of the hiring process. Um, they have conversations about um, promotions and raises, and then it also gives the, the individual the support that they need to be able to have somebody to go to. And that is their true manager within the organization. At the same time, those individuals are working within teams on different clients and being supported and learning from them at that time as well. But that people management structure that we've developed um, and the systems around that and the technology we use to support that has been critical um, in how we um, support our team and, and what we do. In addition to that, you know, we obviously have a uh, we have a uh, I don't know if it's called a social committee or 
you know, we call it a, an experience team or something like that. And we're always trying to do different things. And, um, you know, I think, and, it, and it's not always about getting the whole team together because we have employees, you know, in San Diego, we have employees throughout California. We have employees um, throughout the United States now um, with how, you know, how we service our clients. But it's about creating a common bond, whether it's uh, either remotely uh, through a Zoom or an experience through Zoom or an event that we do, or even getting together in small patch, small little groups. So three or four people getting together for coffee or, uh, you know, some people doing an event over here. Um, and so we try to do, and I think one month we had, you know, 30 or 40 different events where people got together and did different things. And we really promoted that because that creates that, that culture and that creates the, the people like getting together and not just stuck behind their computer screens all day long like we are, you know, post COVID. Yeah. I, when you said social committee, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, the party planning committee from the office. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, you have a couple of people managing party planning. No, I think I think it's great. I think that um, you know people underestimate the importance of having uh, regular and consistent feedback, and uh, it doesn't have to be always because of a disciplinary action that that needs to be taken. Sometimes people need to hear that they're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I try to encourage bosses is like, with the same energy that you tell someone they're doing a bad job use that same energy to tell them they're doing a good job. Like we yep. nitpick things that people are doing wrong, but we don't nitpick when they're doing it right and, and take the opportunity to say that they're doing something right. So yep. that small thing that they do right, we should, we should just as enthusiastically tell them that they're doing it right, even though it's yep. small. The same way that we get upset if somebody writes an email that may be you know, not that great. And so I think yep. that's so true. Having that one-to-one -one connection is really, really powerful. So now you, you know, because of this culture, you've been able to service a lot of people. I got a question yesterday, and this is highly relevant. So I'm going to ask you this to see if maybe you have like um, like a four four part strategy for this. But yeah, how does a person actually select the right accountant? Like that was a question I received because they they said I have an accountant. I don't feel like they give me any kind of strategy. I don't feel like I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be looking for. So how does a person hire the right accountant? or expand on, you know, all the services you do, like accounting or whatever, CFO or analytics. Yep. How do you know you're hiring the right one? Because that's, that's, yeah. that's a challenge. Yeah, that's a, that's a big challenge for business owners because their background is in their business, not in accounting, not in finance, not in marketing, not in sales in most cases. Um, and so, you know, as entrepreneurs, you, the individual gets in, they, they start their business because they know their business they know their product or their service very very well and now all of a sudden they're business owners and they have to you know they have to do all the other stuff that they didn't realize came along with being a business owner right the stuff that you don't hear about on social media that you were talking about earlier which is you know you got to hire people you have to build out uh processes you have to build a foundation for growth and so when it comes to you know hiring all not only accountants but how do you, you know how do you hire a salesperson how do you hire a marketing person how do you do all this stuff um, it's it's very, it can be very difficult um, what I would say is so the first thing I'd say from an overall perspective is know your business um, and that means know every aspect of your business so educate yourself on and, and you know on on finance and accounting you don't have to know how to do journal entries but at least Educate yourself on how to read financial statements. Um, educate yourself on um, on marketing, you know, on, on what that means. Educate yourself on business development and sales. And obviously the operational side, usually the business owner knows because that's what they they know best. Um, and, and that then allows you to, to hire good people, but then also to manage them. And so what, what I see a lot with entrepreneurs is they say, okay, I'm going to start a business. I know how to provide this service or, or this product. And then when I grow a little bit, I'm going to hire a salesperson and that person's going to go, you know, sell a, sell a bunch. Then I'm going to hire an accountant and they're just going to do the, the accounting over here and I don't have to worry about them. And then, you know, I'm still going to be doing this. Well, that's where I see things fail a lot is where if you hiring somebody and then just giving them free reign and not providing them the oversight or direction, um, is is a recipe for for you know disaster in my, in my opinion because 
even though you may hire the expert, they still need um, they still need support, they still need direction, and they still need somebody that is able to collaborate with them to ensure that they're successful. So I'd say, you know, educating yourself on all aspects of your business, on sales, marketing, accounting, finances, understanding how to read financials will really help to understand, will help that individual determine uh, the right individuals that they should be hiring. Um, and on, uh, and also what I would say is talk to an expert. You know, I think at a minimum, most uh, companies use a tax CPA. Um, help them talk to that individual about, uh, have them read the job description, uh, have them even uh, support the an interview, you know, have them interview the person. They'd be, if they're a good advisor to you, just like, you know, I'm sure a lot of your clients are, or listeners are to their clients, they'd be more than happy to participate or to have a conversation with that individual to ensure that that person is the right person for that role. So that that's how I would go about it. Um, we we are obviously very heavily involved with our clients. We're a fractional service. A lot of our clients have that full have a full time person in house, and we support that person too. And so we all obviously help our clients um, when they are looking or when the need does arise that they need to hire a full time person. We're there. We're helping them. We're helping that through them that process. So we can obviously support that. But um, you know, I would I would do all of those things is educate yourself. Uh, lean on an expert that you may know that you and that you also trust. Now, how does your fractional service work? Because um, one of the things that I that I hear from my clients is, well, I don't want to hire a fractional service because I don't feel like I can control the work product. I don't feel like I can get the value that I need. So, how does your how does your fractional service work, and how do you integrate with a company that's not accustomed to having a fractional team? Yeah. Yeah, I think usually there's some sort of a, there's there's got to be some level of pain point up front. Um, if everything's going well, or if the, if the business owner is satisfied, they're they're likely not going to say, "Hey, I'm going to change my accounting now." Um, so there's usually some sort of a pain point, or or they they're experiencing growth beyond the skill set of their team. And so the first question, the first thing that we talk to the business owner about is really understanding their team and and what those those current pain points are understanding the direction and the goals that they have for their firm or their business and where they want to go. So where are they now? Where do they want to go? And then we help to educate them on what that means from an accounting perspective, from a business perspective, from a finance perspective on how they you know, ultimately, ultimately want to get there. But the first step is, you know, we, we assess kind of their, their current environment. So we look at their, their current team, their people, their processes, uh, the technology they're using. So what accounting systems are they using? Um, and you know, what other systems are they using that may integrate within accounting? Uh, and then we look at the reporting infrastructure. And through that, we help to then define the roles and responsibilities of their existing team and then us. Uh, we, uh, and, and also the plan as we move forward so that they have very, a lot of clarity and it's very clear on what they're going to be getting out of this relationship and the value that they're getting out of that, which should be above and beyond, obviously, what they currently have and should be you know, above and beyond the price point from a value perspective that they're seeing as well. In some cases, we do replace their current person or team, but in a lot of cases, they've outgrown their team or their person, and we provide that support of that person to help continue the growth of the company beyond the skill set of that person. And so instead of having to hire a full-time person that, like you said before, they may or may not understand who they're hiring, we now can work with them to provide them that structure, uh, make sure they have the right people doing the right thing at the right time, support the right individual, give them that flexibility, and be very clear with them on consistent communications, how we're working together. Um, again, we're part, we feel we're part of your team. We just don't happen to be sitting in your office every day you know, right next to you, but we're available, we're there, um, we're, we, we, um, you know, we, we want to see you succeed and we're, we're working with you collaboratively and consistently always. Let's talk fraud prevention. I had a client who just recently had an ex-employee, well, they just discovered that they uh, had $119,000 stolen from, from the client. 
Mm-hmm. What are some measures that people can put into place to prevent those kind of things? And then how does a third party accounting service serve as a, I guess, a barrier for, mm-hmm. for stuff like that happening? Yeah. I would say that the biggest challenge with small businesses is that um, they obviously can't afford a full, they can't afford and they don't need a full team, right? So it's very difficult, it can be more challenging to put those controls in place or processes in place to provide, to ensure that there is not fraud happening. Um, but it, it also goes back to what I was saying before, which is um, what I would recommend not doing is hiring a, a bookkeeper or an accountant and then just not just letting them do their thing, right? Hey, you take care of accounting. I'm going to run the business over here. Um, that gives them free reign to do everything. And at the same time, then the business owner doesn't have a full understanding of what's happening from an accounting perspective in their business. And so that's what I was talking about earlier too, about know your business, know what's happening in all areas of your business. So you can provide the oversight and you can provide the um, management of those aspects. So even though you hire me, even though an individual may not have a strong understanding or background in accounting and finance, when they hire somebody in accounting and finance, that person needs to be managed. So that's that's step number one. Um, Also, basic. you know, basic areas of uh, controls can be put in place. So we don't want one person doing everything. You don't want, uh, you want to separate uh, the bill pay process. So you don't want to have that individual just have free reign to be able to pay bills. A lot of times they, you know, somebody can commit fraud. They can easily set up a dummy vendor account and just start paying bills to that vendor, you know, pay, cutting checks to that vendor account. Well, that vendor account is there, is them essentially, and they're they're then stealing funds, right? Another area I've seen it done is through payroll, through expense reimbursements, where they give themselves expense reimbursements. There's no oversight, no review. Nobody's looking at it. They can easily, you know, steal that way. And in some cases, I've seen it where the person even gives themselves a raise because they have full access to payroll. Nobody's looking at it and nobody understands. And it just comes out in one lump sum out of the bank account. And so, you know, those things like we're creating, finding the ability to, to, to provide um, some structure, oversight, managing that person, um, and then create some level of, of barriers and controls uh, as it relates to everything associated with the outflow of cash um, which is, is critical. So that's the AP process, the, the payroll process, um, you know, even understanding the invoicing process and how payments are coming in um, is, is critical as well. So the other option, obviously, is you know making sure you don't just have one person that's doing everything. So you may have uh, an accounting person, but you maybe you have an office manager that can provide uh, can perform some some roles. So there's some checks and balances that is involved in that process. Or maybe you, as the business owner, is performing some roles and should be performing roles on approving out any outgoing payments that are being made and understanding and and being able to tie out any outgoing payments to what's hitting the bank account. So getting that visibility from a reporting perspective is critical. Um, And then, you know, as the company grows, uh, obviously ensuring that it's built out in a way where there are checks and balances. And and that's really the value that we bring, obviously, to the table is we provide those checks and balances. We provide that, that team approach, the structure. We build the processes so that really there is no, you know, there's the, the, the risk of fraud is very, very low when we're involved. One of the things that this person did was that they uh, were writing checks to a to a dummy vendor, and then they were going and cashing the checks. And I think what I recommended after they found this out is like the person who who prints the check can't sign the check; it has to be two two eyeballs yeah. on this. Exactly. In, in, in a scenario where you're involved, would your company print and or sign the check on behalf of the, of the like, like, let's say I, I'm a small company, I have six people yep. and I don't have the, the infrastructure, the manpower to have two people overseeing everything. How would, how would you guys come in to support in that kind of scenario? Yeah, we would set up a process just similar to what you mentioned. We're not a big proponent of cutting physical checks and signing physical checks for a number okay. of reasons. One, a couple of what you pointed out. There's a there's some very inexpensive uh, 
AP automation tools. Bill.com is one. It just automates the the bill pay process so that you never have to cut a manual check again. Um, it either sends directly to the vendor uh, through ACH or it will cut the checks for you. And it creates a process of preparing and approval. Um, so, and it's very inexpensive. It's, you know, probably le less than a hundred bucks a month and it's, you know, a dollar per check, which is basically what postage and, and, uh, and envelopes are these days. And so it's a, it's a way to, and it integrates with QuickBooks, which a lot of companies have as well. And, and it integrates with other systems too. So we, we wanna get away from the manual process of things. So that, that helps to eliminate fraud uh, very easily, you know, a lot, it helps to reduce risk. And what it also does is it creates a set of uh, approval guidelines. So like, as you mentioned before, one person can, can prep the outgoing payments, but then the business owner or somebody else as he is the one that has to approve any outgoing payments. When it's automated like this, they can do it on their phone. They can do it on within the system. And uh, they just check the boxes on what's going out that week, hit pay. They they have the opportunity to review the invoices um, and it goes out. And so one is to you know eliminate the manual process of cutting checks. If you have to do that, exactly what you mentioned, Luis, which is one person prepares them and prints them, somebody else signs them. Uh, the person that signs them should have all of the bills or invoices uh, that they are able to review before they sign them and it goes out. Um, so that is a, a big, you know, a process that uh, has to happen. Um, but ultimately, we want to make sure that, you know, companies are moving away from paper checks and signing because that creates risk in other areas like somebody stealing a check or forging a check or something else like that as well. I agree. I mean, I think that that uh, there's so many options for the the check writing procedure. Uh, we use something where uh, I could I could actually approve it and sign it electronically instead yep. of instead of having to let people handle checks and so forth. So I do agree with that. So um, where can people find you if they want more information about working with you? Uh, you've built a company. You know what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you know what it's like to employ lots of people. You know what it's like to 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 prevent fraud, uh, to work fractionally with people. And I'm sure there's somebody out there who's saying, I need something just like this. So where could people find you to get your services? Yeah, thanks, Luis. It's, uh, our website is signatureanalytics.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Jason Kruger, obviously with it, with Signature Analytics. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I'm happy if anyone wants to email me the letter J Kruger, that's K-R-U-G-E-R -E at signatureanalytics.com. And again, happy when anybody reaches out. Love talking to business owners. Uh, if we can help them, that's great. If not, Usually we know somebody that that can and um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for being on the show. We're so happy that you were able to share that information about fraud prevention. I think that's going to help a lot of people. Uh, I know, especially in, in, in a world where uh, cash tends to have a lot of legs. So uh, I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, you've been listening to the Guts and Glory Show. You've been listening to the Guts and Glory Show. For more and to learn more about Louise, hit the website at louisescottjr.com. For consulting opportunities, hit eightfigurefirm.com. That's the number eightfigurefirm.com. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll see you next time on the Guts and Glory Show. <laughs>